David's going to come now and read John chapter 18, verses 12 through 27. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither the Jews always resort. In secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Enterest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? And Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore to him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. While these men bound our Lord, the high priest, and took him to an earthly priest to be tried. Without the Spirit, men reject the true and living God. For only Christ could be that perfect sacrifice and save his people with his blood. Open our eyes to see. Amen. What a powerful portion of scripture that we have to consider together today and not one that I want us to take lightly. I've entitled this Christ's Trial and Peter's Denial. A lot of times in a title, if it's catchy, you'll remember it. Christ's trial, Peter's denial. Really, it says everything about who Christ was to be the advocate for sinners. The reason he was on trial was because had he not come, had he not stood in the place of sinners just like Peter, then there would be no salvation. We would be just like Peter, denying him all the way. And so, in this particular passage, that we have before us, it's unique in that John here, directed by the Spirit of God, supplies details that are not given in the other Gospels. I'd encourage you to always go out and kind of do a comparison. There's a harmony of the Gospels. You can read what is said in John and then in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Makes an interesting study. But here specifically, we find John being directed to write what was not written in those other Gospels. And I believe that's the beauty of how the Spirit of God has inspired this word, because together we see the complete picture. And the scriptures say what? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every truth be established. So this is not just some fanciful, made-up speculation about what took place. We're reading the very word of God here. Now, the other Gospels do describe our Lord's appearing before Caiaphas. And it's interesting that Caiaphas and Annas would have known John because we just read it in Acts 4, didn't we? They were there when that lame man was healed and they got called in before them to testify as to by what name that man was healed. And the Lord gave Peter great 
boldness at that time to declare, he didn't just say in the name of Jehovah God, which would have probably gotten him off the hook, but in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, this man stands whole before you. So we see times where Peter was caused to stand boldly before the Lord, and yet, lest we should idolize Peter, like so many do, and think, oh, if I could be just like Peter, well, you wouldn't want to be in any sense, except for really by nature that we all are just like him. One instance, declaring Christ in his glory and boldness, and the next, denying him. But here, this fourth gospel, where the Lord appeared before Caiaphas, it's passed over. Now it says there in verse 14 that he was led away in verse 13 to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas. So we find Annas mentioned here being the father-in-law of Caiaphas. But here in uh, this fourth gospel, he does not go into detail about how Christ would have appeared before Caiaphas. Here, the emphasis is placed upon his arraignment before Annas. It's interesting that as in the garden, when they came to arrest our Lord Jesus Christ, so even now in this high priest palace, we see our Lord's perfections shine forth prominently as the savior of that people that he came to save. Yes, he was to be maligned. He was to be afflicted. He was to be falsely testified of by those in authority. And yet we see here, even in the face of all of this, how he stood above all those that accused him. And, uh, had one purpose, and that was to glorify his father, who had sent him forth to be the advocate of sinners. As the Son of God, we actually see him exposing the wickedness of all that with whom he comes into contact, even when they struck him on the face there with the palm of the hand in verse 22 that we read, he declares very plainly in verse 23, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. You can imagine the court of law, a judge suddenly reaching out and slapping the defendant. It's unheard of. The judge would be taken off the case. And so the Lord says, if this is a true trial, then bring forth that for which I'm being accused. But if well, why smitest thou me? Well, we know that he was smitten not only because of the depravity of the heart and the hatred of these that were judging him, but we know that it was determined already, don't we, in prophecy, that he would be smitten of men and afflicted. So here we see the unfolding of that even here. So this portion that we have before us, although simple, is quite complex when we break it down and consider all the different aspects of what is unfolded here. First of all, from Christ being led away to Annas, as we saw there in verse 12, the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus. It wasn't that they overpowered him, but he willingly went according to how the Lord, his father, was directing him. But they took him and bound him. And it's interesting, then, after declaring that, that the Holy Spirit takes John in writing this. It's almost like it's a parenthesis, and yet it's not. It's very much a part of the entire story. First focused on Christ being bound and taken away, and then suddenly now recording Peter's first denial. Remember, the Lord said, even though Peter had boldly said, Lord, I'll go with you to prison even to death. And Christ had told him, the cock will not crow, but what you'll have denied me three times. So here now in verse 15, we have 
in 16, we have the denial of Peter sent forth. All the while Christ is being brought to stand before these false judges, we find this first recording of Peter's denial. And he's left there warming himself at the fire. He'd followed our Lord somewhat at a distance. And then we have the brief account that's given of what passed between Annas and Christ. And then following that announcement that Annas had sent Jesus bound to Caiaphas, there in verse 13, the Spirit then returns again to Peter. And that's where we see him describing the second and third denial. Exactly unfolded as the Lord Jesus Christ had declared. You say, well, what's the main point? Well, the main point here is plainly, yes, Christ appearing before Annas and afterwards before Pilate. That's where this is headed. But this narrative is erupted again and yet again to speak of the apostles' awful denial and awful fall. The Lord would use this later on in Peter's life to remind him as he was sent forth himself into the world to declare Christ and him crucified and would ultimately himself, according to what history records, die in crucifixion. That's how Peter would die. But such was his honor and respect of our Lord that he refused to be crucified as Christ had. He asked to be crucified upside down. And that's how he would die, ultimately. But this shows the preserving grace and power of God. And when we look at our own lives, how many of us can look back and see how many times we have denied the Lord? To not see it is to be blind, even to our own failings in our walk. And yet, none of that will ever cause the Lord to cast off any one of his own. Because that's why Christ came, to pay the sin debt of such wanderers as we are. You know, that's what sheep do. They wander without a shepherd. Turn them loose. Boy, they're going to get in trouble. And so we see that even here with Peter. But most vividly here, we see that God is directing in all that is taking place. And if the Holy Spirit makes such a prominent image here of the sin of Simon Peter in this portion of scripture is to teach us one thing. This is the kind of sinner that Christ came to save. Paul said it later on. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came to save righteous, no, sinners, and even himself, he said, of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul himself was the most amazed that he should be an object of grace because we know that he was part of this Sanhedrin at this time that would condemn our Lord Jesus Christ to death, issue that death sentence, ultimately. And yet, in the end, he himself was a, an object of God's grace. He said it there in Galatians 1. 15, he was separated from his mother's womb, but called by his grace. And I believe that here we can see then how clear the scriptures teach that where sin did abound, what did Paul write? Grace did much more abound. And if you're the Lord's and he's taught you, this is your testimony. We can't sit here and read this as if we're just idle bystanders in what is revealed here. Now we see our Lord Jesus Christ glorified, glorifying even his father, not backing down in the face of everything he knew that he should suffer at the hands of these men, but doing all to the glory of his father. Now when it says here, as we saw last time, they took and bound him, that is an important part, I believe, of this chapter, which I would be remiss in not underscoring before we get in any further. Why did they bind the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I can give you four reasons. It's interesting. 
First of all, we know that they bound him fast. That's the way it's put there in Matthew 26 and verse 48. And there I will have you look over to Matthew's rendering of this. And it gives us the reason why he was bound. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 48, it says, Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss. So here he's preparing these even before going into the garden. But what do you read there? That same is he. Hold him fast. Why did they bind him? There was money involved. They had paid him to betray Christ. And so now he's saying to them, once you get your hands on him, you bind him fast and do not let him go. Not even Judas knew exactly how the Lord would deal with this. He already saw his power there in the garden when all he said was, I am, and they all fell backward. It was, he was not bound because they overpowered him. He was bound because these were following the instruction. That's what men do. As they follow one another and money exchanges hands, a lot of evil is done. But because of that money and because of Judas, it was stated that they bound him fast. This doesn't mean that they just had a loose bind on him. They literally would have bound him to the point of, if it were any one of us, it would probably cut into the skin. This was a tight binding. But again, to their own delusion, thinking that somehow that would keep him from doing his work. That's the first reason we find. But secondly, we'd have to say that he was bound because they would heap shame on him. Remember, this is why they came for our Lord Jesus Christ. Here he was, Jesus of Nazareth. Boy, they're going to heap shame upon him. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews wrote about. Who for the, the, uh, the sin that was put upon him, he endured the cross despising what? The shame. When they took somebody like this, of course they were taking him as a political prisoner. They were going to shame him. And shame any that would ever put any kind of trust in him. Try to treat him as a lawless character. <laughs> and yet here he was, the very son of God that they could find no sin in him. You know, there was ne ever, never any sin in Christ. When he went to that cross, it's because God purposed to put the sin of his people on him. But that's the picture here of what it was for the Lord Jesus Christ to be bound and carried before these high priests. It was that he might in some way bear the shame. But thirdly, it was because they did deem him worthy of death. And so when they came to bind him, they bound him as they would a criminal. And that's why he had to be delivered up as one who would be the sin bearer before God. But they were, while they were doing what they would do to him, they were all the while accomplishing God the Father's will concerning him. They were here binding him to deliver him up and crucify him. And yet they were offering up the Lamb of God. But they didn't see it, didn't know it. From their perspective, they deemed him worthy. Not just of being bound, but here to be led all the way to death. That's where this was headed. But behind all of this, we'd have to say that the fourth reason, which is the most important, why the Lord Jesus Christ was bound, was that this would be a fulfillment of the types and prophecies that he came to accomplish. You say, how's that? Well, in the picture of the sacrifices, when they were put on that altar, burnt offering out in front of the temple to be offered up and burnt, those sacrifices were taken and bound to the altar. If you look with me in Psalm 118 and verse 27, 
So even though these here would not have been happy to know that they were actually fulfilling scripture, <laughs> here all the while, our Lord was fulfilling scripture. They were fulfilling it exactly as the Old Testament required when it was a matter of taking a lamb or an offering to offer it before the Lord. Psalm 118 and verse 27. You can put in the margin next to this verse, Christ. It says, God is the Lord, which has showed us light. And what does it say? Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. I, in studying through this, never saw a time where they ever unbound Christ. All the way until the cross, from this point forward. That's how fast things were moving. They didn't bind him, and then once he got in front of the high priest, then unbound him. No, he was bound. This was God's time. The clock was ticking. This was the hour. This was the time. This was the minute that now this offering should be offered unto, unto God. And so this binding, the significance of it, is deeper than just what men were doing to him. He was fulfilling all that the scriptures declared and what was the reason for him being here it wasn't any sin of his own that's what he was saying to this high praise how come you're smiting me if I've spoken evil then bear witness of that evil but if well why smitest thou me that's back here in John 18 verse 23 and you notice he couldn't give an answer there wasn't an answer the only thing that it says next, remember I said once he was bound, he was bound. Because verse 24 says what? Now Annas had sent him what? Bound. So what began in that garden would continue all the way to the cross. And in that he was fulfilling the picture of what it was to take those sacrifices of the Old Testament and to offer this one, this one sacrifice up unto the Lord. And so it was that he went willingly. You know, he didn't fight it. Could he have called 10,000 angels and destroyed the world? Yes, but that's not why he came. Could he have even here spoken again, I am, and they all fall backward? Yep. Even when eventually he gets in front of Pilate, and Pilate ask him a question and he wouldn't answer Pilate initially and Pilate said don't you know I have power he was thinking of his earthly power to condemn you crucify you and what did the Lord say to him you'd have no power at all except that that was given of my father oh I love to read this story for that reason because <laughs> there's like a subplot in there there's two things going on you're seeing where this is headed and yet all these other over here don't see it what a beautiful story. And yet it was necessary that our Lord go through this. Someone said that he was bound by men because of their sin as the sacrifice. But he was bound by God the Father who purposed that it should be. But oh, he was bound with cords of love for that people for which he came to save. And if the Lord has paid our sin debt, that's how we see this. This He's taken my place. He was bound in my place. And so, in verses 13 and 14, i got to get off verse 12, otherwise you're going to say, well, you're just stuck on verse 12 again. <laughs> verses 13 and 14, we see this trial before Annas and then Peter's denial. It says that he was led away to Annas. They led him away to Annas first, now, Annas was not the official high priest, but as father-in-law to Caiaphas, he was the one who put Caiaphas in office. So we see even here the conniving and the back-scratching and the way that these priests worked in that day. You know, the Jews, they have a commentary on the scriptures called the Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D. You may have seen that sometimes in some commentaries where the Talmud 
says this or the Talmud says that. It's interesting here that in the Jewish commentary on what took place with Christ, they had their commentaries, but also particularly with regard to the priesthood, this to show you how evil these priests were. They weren't serving God's interests, they were serving their own. That's why when Christ came into the temple in the beginning, he took that cord and, and chased out the money changers. There was a lot of evil going on in self-interest. When people would bring their sacrifices, these are the ones that would say, no, it doesn't pass muster. They would take that sacrifice and go put it in the sheepfold behind, and then they'd bring out one they'd just taken away and say to them, now you gotta buy this one. And all that money exchanging hands, they're robbing the, the people, even the poor, and all of that in their own interest. But with regard to Annas, I found this interesting. They said, woe to the house of Annas, woe to their serpent's hiss. <laughs> That's how the Jews saw these people. And we see it today. You can tell when preachers are corrupt. All kinds of things going on. It was so in that day. They are high priests. Their sons are keepers of the treasury. Most leaders today, that's the one reason they're in their power positions, because of the money. And their sons-in-laws are guardians of the temple, and their servants beat the people with staves. Annas and his household were notorious. So when they brought him to Annas, they're bringing him before the chief of the mob. This would be just like bringing him before the godfather of the mob. And so when they led our Lord to Annas, we can see that it was with this purpose to kind of beat him up a little bit, break him down a little bit, and then send him on to the next. And yet, as I said, all of this, God had purposed that it be done, again, as part of the trial and affliction of what our Lord should endure at the hands of sinners. Let's remember that these were our representatives. If we say that Christ died for our sin, that means then that these were our representatives in beating Christ, smiting him, saying all manner of evil against him as our representative. And that brings us to just shame and to bow and to consider that had we been there, we would have done the same thing. And so, as we read already concerning Caiaphas, it's mentioned here when they led him away to Annas, verse 13, his father-in-law, he was a father-in-law to Caiaphas, it says, which was the high priest that same year, they rotated high priests. They weren't going to let one stay too long with all that power and influence. They were going to, on to the next, hey, we got to share this wealth. And you notice John specifically states Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. When was that stated? Well, remember in John chapter 11, if you look there, John chapter 11 and verses 49 to 52. This is already recorded by John. It says here that they had gathered the chief priests, in verse 47, the Pharisees, a council and said, what do we for this man doth many miracles? This is back when he was, his fame was growing. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Really, that means all manner of men, because there would always be those who would not. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. What was their concern? Pres preserving their power. They didn't want wrote, uh, word getting back to Rome that somehow there was a subversion going on here, a revolution with people following this one man. So they had to quell it. And one of them, here it is, named Caiaphas. This is what John refers to here. Being the high priest that same year said unto them, ye know nothing at all nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. <laughs> Out of the mouth of an unconverted priest, wicked, evil, 
and yet he's caused to state a truth that only those who are truly children of God can see and rejoice in. Yes, it took one man dying that the people might be saved. And verse 51 makes it clear. As the Spirit directed John to write, This spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. What nation? That people that the Father gave him to save, for whom he came to pay the sin debt. Here we see plainly how the Lord is sovereign, even in using unconverted men to declare his truth, whether they believed it or not. So coming back here now, we see the switch in verses 15 and 16. Now what I want us to see here, the focus is on Peter, but there's someone else with Peter in there. John's there with him. And here in verses 15 and 16, it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus. When it says, and so did another disciple, it's supposed that John is speaking of himself. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus under the palace of the high priest. So you've got Peter staying out, but here John taking advantage of, of being known of the high priest. We don't know exactly how it was he was known. Some speculate that there may have been even a family connection with this high priest, or some say it might have even been a business connection because before John was a fisherman, maybe he was the one that kept food on these guys' table. And so when he went in there, he would have known him. But just remember, just like Peter denied our Lord, this same John is the one that when they came to seize our Lord, it describes him as having fled with the rest. In fact, fled naked. Such was his, his uh, desire to get on out, leaving his garment and running so he could run fast enough to get away from what was taking place. And now we see him creeping in along with Peter, thinking that somehow because the high priest knew him that he wouldn't face too much speculation as to why he was there. And it says there in verse 16, but Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, so again, this is John writing of himself, which was known unto the high priest and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. So all of this little conniving going on, following Christ from afar, and yet in the end they all would abandon him. Exactly like it says there in Zechariah. Smite the shepherd and what? The sheep scatter. That's the way the Lord first. The Lord had already told him, you're not going to enter in in any part to what is about to take place with me. We add nothing to the work of Christ. We cannot contribute in any way in that work that he came to accomplish. And so we see Peter here in that first denial, as I said, standing and warming himself. That means it was chilly. Even that our Lord would have been facing and enduring the chill of the night, the darkness of the night. All of these can be represented spiritually of what he had to endure to accomplish the salvation of this people for whom he came. Here it says in verse 17, the damsel that kept the door unto Peter said, Art that not thou also one of this man's disciples? When it uses that term man, it's in a, in a derogatory sense, this fellow. Art thou not one of those? And the servants and officials stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. <clears throat> stood with them. Stood with these who were about to condemn our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke, when you read his portion, is quite definite that they and Peter were sitting, and even Matthew, they were together. And John seems to speak 
of them and Peter as standing, but these words are used by John as an idiom that they were, he was there to continue. He was identifying with these who were Christ's persecutors. And that's where in verses 19 and 21, we see the high priest, Annas, asking Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. This is a court case. What's the first thing you do when you have a defendant? You call your witnesses. And that's what they are doing here with Christ in verse 19. Where are your witnesses? The high priest then asked Jesus, what, of his disciples and of his doctrine. They were trying to get Christ to betray these who were his disciples. But that's why Christ answered, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort and in secret have I said nothing. They tried to accuse our Lord of hiding something. No, they, he was plain who he was. It was plain what his teaching was. And that's why he says there in verse 21, Why askest thou me? If you're going to make this a court case, go ahead. Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. Here was Peter and John. The Lord could have just as easily ordained that they be brought in at this point to testify. But he didn't. He kept... He made this statement, but he kept them apart. Why? Because he was their advocate. And yet, they knew who he was. And uh, therefore, later, they would be called upon to witness, even though at this time, they didn't. So that's where we see the end of Jesus' appearance before Annas in verses 22 to 24. When he had thus spoken, one of the officers which struck, that stood by struck him, we saw that already. And uh, even though this man's name is not recorded, yet his crime was. Without warning, he takes and strongly, that word slapped or smote that's used there is a, a, a solid hit with the palm of the hand of Christ as the accused. But again, it's a picture of what he endured without cause. They hated him without cause. Oh, this ought to cause us to, to bow in admiration. And that's where we see in verses 25 to 27, Peter is brought to deny vehemently, not just one time, but three times, as the Lord said, even to the point of swearing. Such was the degree to which he was attempting to protect himself. But it was necessary. Even as it said, smite the shepherd and the sheep scatter. This is where we see the initial scattering, the withdrawal. And as we're going to read in another portion later on, when Christ came out of that judgment hall, all he did was look upon Peter, and Peter wept. It's just a look. But the Lord brought him to bow and to recognize that unless Christ would pay his debt, that uh, there would be no hope for him. And then it says in John 13, 38, after his final denial, that the, it's back in 13, 38, where Christ said that when the, before the rooster crowed, he would deny him three times. Crowing to the roosters early in the morning, didn't it? That gives us an idea of what was taking place here. But this fulfilled what the Lord said back in, in John 13 and verse 38. And it would have immediately reminded Peter, as he heard that rooster crow, that all things were exactly as God had purposed. So Jesus' trial is not over, but Peter's denial. That, when you look at that picture, here's Christ standing in trial in the place of, as the advocate of, these very sinners that he came to save. And you can look at every one of the disciples. They all fled. But in the end, when it's all said and done, because Christ came to save them, he brought them together. He rose and went and gathered each one again to himself. And in the end, caused them to persevere. Read First and Second Peter. Read what we're re reading here with John. He fled too. And yet we're reading now of the Lord's grace in preserving them. And certainly we can identify with that if we're the Lord's people, can't we? We'll leave it there and come back. Pick this up next time.